Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Ezekiel, the founder and CEO of Creative Virtual, and I'm joined today by Phil Hall, the founder and MD of Elsewhere. And uh, today we want to talk about conversational AI, which is a very topical subject at the moment, and some of the issues that we're both uh, seeing, at, seeing around this. And I wanted to start off by uh, touching on what risks and what concerns organizations that we talk to have about deploying these technologies and also the benefits that they see as well because you know obviously we're I know we're both having lots of conversations with customers partners in this space so yeah why don't you get us kicked off Phil and uh, and touch on that subject mm, yeah sure love to I think the um the phase that we're in at the moment with conversational AI is um uh, is an interesting one and and I'd actually put the uh, the root of it at the beginning of the neural network push, the machine learning piece, before the large language models really started uh, kicking up, uh, there was a lot of talk right then. And that path, I think, took us down into sort of no code, low code space. But the large language models, um, you know, and uh, uh, the, what, the enormous models, um, which we have in play right now, uh, I think have um, shocked people by their ability to be able to engage in conversation. Uh, and to be able to create a meaningful conversation very quickly. But I think what's terrifying people still is the ability for the systems to um, hallucinate. Who knows who gave that term? I mean, I'm not sure about you, Chris. Do you, do you see when things are going wrong in these systems as hallucinations, or would you frame it in a different sense with your experience? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, we've been in natural language processing world for those 20 odd years. So, um, we're used to uh, dealing with things when they go wrong and making sure you know they they can be put right. I think it's an interesting term, uh, but you know who are we to argue against the term that's being used industry wide? So <laughs> we're going with that term for now. But I agree. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I, I think for us, it's about kind of you know keeping the system uh, or keeping the companies that use these systems in control, and that's what we've been really concentrating on. You know, as a as a company. Um, I mean, we've spoken, I've spoken to personally, I think, you know, 250, perhaps nearly 300 people in the last few months as we've been talking to our customers and, and partners and what we, I mean, of course, the the ability for it to be controlled is limited because these models, you know, are, are black boxes by their very nature. Um, but there are things that you can put around it to help control them. And we've we done the same back 20 years ago with raw based natural language processing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're doing with regression testing and we're doing the same now with uh, similar principles, different techniques, but um, same principle, I guess, uh, but with different techniques. And, yeah, I think that's the key thing, really, today. Organizations want to deploy it, but they want they, they, they want they don't want the risk to their brand of the system hallucinating. So I think it's a good word in the sense that it frightens people. You know, if this system mm. can, if, it, if, it, if you say, oh, it can give the wrong answer, hallucinating, you know, I don't know, a, a, a much more dramatic way of describing it. But, but I do think it's created fear in the organizations we talk to. Mm. And all of them are saying to us, we want to implement this stuff, but how can we control it? And that's what we, we, mm. we've, we've been focused on. Mm. I mean, if you go back um, into our uh, history a little bit, we probably use terms which are less um, fashionable now, false positives, um, yeah. false negatives, you know, and the ability for a system to be able to, well, I mean, in many ways, those things for me are, are very similar, uh, but I think that sort of the, where this is pointing to for me and the conversations that are coming through, because as you know, elsewhere is, um, is very different from creative virtual. We work in um, healthcare, entertainment, education, uh, we do consultancy pieces quite heavily. We've really stepped back from the customer contact and understanding piece. Yeah? Um, and it's the uh, ability for people to um, uh, see this as, uh, as a, a, a magic bullet um, to save money. Um, I saw an article this morning about these people used to make jobs and now they fix air conditioners and walk dogs. So these were copywriters and so on. So, I mean, there's this kind of thing that's coming up. And then uh, again, earlier this week, there's so much moving parts right now. I mean, it's exactly the reason we're having these conversations, Chris, isn't it? Because with our 20 years of history, <laughs> we can pick some of the useful stuff out of the noise, the background noise. But, you know, it's that, um, uh, you know, is 
Is McKinsey, when they are reporting that 50% of their staff are using ChatGPT in their working worlds, um, are they doing that because they're not concerned that their IP is bleeding into the model or at least being fed um, into a position where they are losing control of it? Or is ChatGPT an evolution of um, a search engine? It's just the latest way for people to get information. And would you trust Bing or Google or Alta Vista or, you know, let's go back into dim distant past kind of thing? Maybe, maybe not. Or maybe it's a, a path which is about Siri when Siri came out and everybody was like, well, that's the end of it. I know you and I talked at the time and wondered whether that would be the end of our working world. And um, and it wasn't very good. And it's still not terribly good. Same with Alexa. So so I think this kind of what is ChatGPT as an entity, um, ignoring people's desire to turn it into something that is human like is um, is the kind of thing that's uh, the you know, we've we've had an eye on for a long time, isn't it, Chris? Yes, absolutely. Phil. But I think, you know, talking to customers and partners and seeing what their fears and concerns are has, has been really the key thing for us to understand what needs to be done. And we've taken some really practical steps to address their concerns. For instance, you know, it's possible now to, to deploy these models locally. Mm. Uh, one of the big concerns is having the, the data being passed to servers remote, not, not just from a security and data protection and trust point of view, uh, but also yeah, performance wise, you know, these, these models have become very busy, people are using them day in, day out. They're, they're not that reliable today. Of course, that will change. There are times when they're offline. So for us, you know, the, the protecting that brand trust and identity for the large enterprises we work for, um, one of the things is to be able to deploy these models on premise or in a in a private cloud for that organisation. So you know, we've, we, that's one of the concerns we've addressed. And another concern is uh, how do we get around the hallucination, uh, you know, the false positives or whatever we want to kind of term it as today. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and so what we've done about that is is to be able to um you know kind of fine tune by including these natural language processing rules uh, that can or perhaps override is is a better way than than fine tune but being able to let the organization in certain cases you know take control of the conversation more directly so not just to um uh, rely on the model completely but to have this hybrid approach which we've always advocated even before the large language models with the neural net approach um, alongside the rules. So we've always had this combination of a human in the loop, the human element in those enterprises for them to be able to control it and take control where it makes sense. And, you know, as as the as the um, chances of hallucination diminish, and we, we see that being uh, a lot better with GTP4 than, say, GPT 3.5, then, and, and some of these models we're deploying locally are, are, are comparable now with, 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 with those, those models that I've just mentioned. So I think the combination of being able to install it locally and be able, being able to, through, through a platform, uh, our platform's called vPortal, but through a platform, and that enable organizations to kind of make the more the whole thing more controllable in some of the ways I've just described with maybe using rules to override the, the or take control of the conversations where, where you need to. I think I think those those two things in particular are practical things that we've done based on the concerns that that we've been seeing. And the big benefits that we're seeing is that, you know, let's look at the positive side of it. These models are already trained. The organizations don't need to keep training them like they need to do with a neural net every time they add more content and 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 create lots of samples of questions um, for intents. Uh, you know, so it's really transformed the way we can deploy these models and the cost um, associated with doing that. Not just the initial deployment, but the ongoing on, ongoing maintenance side of it. So I think that's where we're we're seeing the biggest benefits. Mm.